Alfred Street, grace and peace be unto you from God who loves us as mother and father and Jesus Christ who always and alone is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning and our returning redeemer. I'm Pastor Wesley and I thank you for logging on to another episode of Meet the Street. You know, in Alfred Street, we say all the time the words of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. Be careful how you treat strangers because you might be dealing with angels. The writer of Hebrews understood that you've got to be careful because you never really know who you're dealing with. You never know who you're sitting next to. That's why we have these episodes of Meet the Street, because you never know who you're sitting next to in Alfred Street Baptist Church. There are some phenomenal sisters and brothers who are doing some amazing things in the world. And when they come to Alfred Street, there's no air, there's no arrogance, there's no ego. They just sit and they worship the Lord. And you would never know that they're doing some of the amazing things God has called and created them to do. And in these episodes, it's our desire to introduce you to some of those amazing members of Alpha Street Baptist Church. I'm excited that one of them is here today, Amber Thomas. Amber, welcome to Meet the Street. Thank you, sir. I appreciate being here. We are glad to have you. Glad to have you. Look, we're going to walk to where you are, but people need to know who Amber Thomas is. You are a senior vice president at the NAACP. It blows my mind, too. <laughs> yeah. What role do you play there? So I'm uh, over operations. And um, if you think of the Titanic of an organization, the behemoth of an organization, uh, much like Alpha Street, um, yeah. is, is age <laughs> oh, old. You know, yeah. Preach to the choir now. <laughs> um, age old and uh, we're 114 years old. And my job is to make sure that we're around for at least another 114. So wow. I do a lot of work. Amber, if I can ask, how old are you? I'm 35. You're 35? I am. And you've reached the senior vice president level at 35. I have. Would I you have. be one of the youngest to achieve that in the NAACP? We have. I need to go back and look at some of the old files, but I, probably among the youngest, probably. Well, we got to figure out how you got there. Yeah. That, that's why you're here. We need to know the road to ledger there. So where does the story of Amber Thomas begin? Where were you born? Let's walk through some of your history before we get to the NAACP. Well, uh, thank you again. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the opportunity and the platform to be able to tell my story. Uh, it is humbling and awesome. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, so where, did, where do I start? Um, I would say it began when I ran for second grade class president. All right. Yep. That's when <laughs> I realized. Where were you born? What I, city? I was born in Jackson, Mississippi. Okay. I um, am a product of Jackson Public Schools. Um, my mother and father instilled in me at an early age that if you believe you can, you can. Um, so I remember learning that the uh, second grade was going to have a, a class uh, council and I wanted to be president. And I remember writing a little speech and having my mama proofread it. And I ended up winning. And my first piece of policy um, that I passed for our uh, class was we had such good behavior in the hallway. And other teachers would always say, your class is doing really well. Well, I told Miss Persons, one of my favorite teachers to this day, I said, well, if we get three compliments in the hallway, then we should have be able to vote on the party of our choice, a pizza party. <laughs> um, a subway party, and, in, and it ended up working. Sounds like good second grade politics. <laughs> yes, it was great, but that, that was like a little petri dish, a petri dish of how policy can, can, you know, can start. Um, if you find enough folks who believe in you know, something that needs to change, people will get involved and, and they'll do it. And I remember my classmates being really, really happy with me because we had a lot of pizza and yeah, had a lot of Subway. Yeah, I bet you were fan favorite, yep, huh? we did. Now, Amber, but that wasn't where it ended. You went on to bigger things even before college came your way, yeah. especially in high school. Tell us a little bit about some of the advocacy that you pushed for even in high school. In high school, um, I had uh, kept running for positions, so I, I ran for junior class president. And while I was there, um, uh, we were having a little bit of an upset in class. And our um, teacher at the time, he kind of threw the towel in one day and he was just like, you know what? You all don't know anything about your history. That's why you act like this. And you know, he was having one of those moments where he was frustrated with the class. And uh, a friend of mine said, well, you know, since you say we don't know our history, this high school hasn't had a black history program in years, not, not since I've been here, not since my mom has been here. And everybody, you know, kind of had a moment. And he said, well, you know, forget about uh, geometry, because we were in geometry class. He said, forget about geometry. You all go ahead and take this time. If you could have a black history program, what does it look like? 
And just to have a teacher who could switch gears on a dime like that mm -hmm. and give us the autonomy in the classroom to be able to do that, first of all, was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we outlined this program, submitted our proposal to uh, the powers that be, the principal administration. And they told us, because um, the, the principal at the time, it was a majority black high school. I would say maybe 98%. The principal was a, a, a white guy, a white man. Um, and he said, well, I don't want to spend time forcing uh, that culture down other people's throats. Sounds very scary to where we are even right yeah. now in 2023. Yeah. But go ahead. Yeah, it, it was, yeah, definitely. Um, and I remember being uh, the only one in his office when he said that to me um, and being a, probably a 16 or 17 year old sitting across from a man who was in a big chair at a big desk, you know, telling me no. But I knew in my heart that this is something that we needed at school. And I knew that it was a lot of folks behind me who also wanted that to happen. Um, but he, he told us no. And instead of us backing down, we began to organize. And at that time, I didn't know that what I was doing was organizing. I had, mm -hmm. I had no yeah. idea. All I knew is you had to do little things to get to the big thing. So I don't think Facebook was around at that time, or maybe they were sending out invitations. I, I can't remember. But I remember sending out an email uh, with a little calendar and saying, these are the things that we're going to do across February on our own. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of those times uh, we were supposed to wear uh, the, I forgot what you call them, but it's the board that goes in front of you and in, on the back of you. And you can write something on it. And then it's connected almost like uh, suspenders. Yeah, yeah. And you can wear it. So we all agreed you were going to pick a black history fact. You're going to write it on your post poster boards and you were going to wear it all day throughout uh, school. I got off the bus that morning. I strapped on my my black history fact. Can't remember what it was. Don't ask me because I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But I, I strapped it on and I walked into the gym. It was like the bullpen where they held us before the bell rang. And I was the only person. The only one. The only one with the with the fact on. But I made up my mind. <laughs> I was like. You know, be it resolved, this is what I have to do to, to keep on going. Um, and it gave other students courage to complete the other tasks that, that we had. Um, we had people doing protest poetry in the middle of the hallways. And um, the last day we wore, uh, I think, black, red, green, and yellow. However you wanted to do it, your little fashion. It was when people came with hair, belts, and you know, it was just a self-expression day. And I made a, a shirt that said, uh, Black History is American History on the front. And I did it with acrylic paint. Um, because I didn't have access to like a, a real t-shirt printer or anything like that. And then on the back of it, it said acknowledgement is necessary. Hmm. And I wore it to school and everybody was like, yeah, right on. That's, you know, that's good. But while we were, funny enough, we were having a beauty and bow pageant. So while, because that was a priority for that administration, a beauty and bow pageant. We, we could still have in the month of February, but we couldn't have a, a black history program. But I was inside on the stage, I think hanging up streamer or something for the beauty and bow pageant. And the security officer walked in and he was like, Amber, don't shoot the messenger, but they want you in the office. And I was like, what do they want me in the office for? Because at that time, I'm a baby. I'm, you know, 16, 17. I said, what do they want me in the office for? And he said, might have something to do with your shirt. I said, okay. All right, sir. So the shirt that black history is American history. Yep. Okay. Uh, acknowledgement is necessary. And so I go up and I go into the principal's office. They asked me to turn the shirt inside out and uh, or mm. be suspended. And uh, I called my dad and I, I said, Dad, uh, and just so happens he was home. Um, I said, Dad, they want me to turn my shirt inside out. He said, the mess you made on the dining room table? I was like, yes, <laughs> that mess. He was like, um, he said, so what are you going to do? And uh, I said, well, I think I ought to turn it inside out. And I think having it inside out is actually going to upset more people when I go back to class because people are going to see that now my shirt is inside out and I can tell them why. He said, that's a good strategy. Do that. You know, and he gave me that space to do that. Um, and, and thank you for that, Dad. Um, and I end up going back and people getting upset. And that kind of spiraled for folks to call their parents and talk to their parents about it later on throughout the weeks. Um, it ended up on a radio station, it ended up on the news. And before I knew it, um, the Jackson City branch of NAACP reached out to me and said, hey, we want to meet at Anderson Methodist Church. Um, can you come out? Because we, we want to talk about what's going on. So I'm thinking it's just going to be a few of us, the same faithful few who've been showing up to, to most of the things. And when I pulled into the parking lot, it must have been about 80 students Wow! and some of their parents. Wow. And he asked, he was like, well, he said, who's leading y'all? Like, who's really leading? And people kind of turned and looked at me because I was looking around, too. But 
it was me that, you know, that, that they were looking at. And I was like, okay, this is a moment. And he said, so what, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, what do you want to do? I said, well, you know, I kind of want to um, make news. He said, you'll probably be the news. And I said, okay, <laughs> that's interesting. And, and he ended up being a, a, a really good um, mentor and supporter. Um, and after the NACP um, city branch met with Jackson uh, Public School superintendent, we ended up having a black history program on April 6th, the night before junior prom. And I ended up getting more high schools across the district involved in what we were doing. So it ended up being a, a really big thing. And if I'm not mistaken, they still have a black history program to this day. Um, and I need to check on it to make sure that they're still doing it. But that, that, those moments um, being you know, picked on, uh, bullied kind of by the administration there, because I end up get, still getting some residual stuff after that, because you can't make that kind of change yeah. and, and show the school in that light and ha not have little things happen to you. So I ended up still getting suspended for something. I think I was in the hall a couple seconds after the bell rang, and he was like, you're suspended. And I ended up being suspended for that. Um, but, but it ended up being amazing. Amber, there's a whole lot that just happened in that story. Um, from your recognition that sometimes you gotta do the little things to change the big thing. Mm -hmm. Recognizing even at a young age that no's aren't always permanent, yes. but that they can be challenged by people in authority, especially when they don't represent us. So when you tell me a white principal in a school that's 98% black, mm -hmm. you have to know that, that his voice doesn't represent all of you and yes. you start to see that. Let me ask you this because you said, you know, only 16 at the time, there's a calling of one of the prophets in the Bible who pushes back on God and says, you can't use me, I'm only a child, I can't speak. Do you ever look back now and see God sowing seeds of who you would become even when you were 16 and going through this in high school to lead to where you are? Because I think sometimes, you know, when we land in life, we can look back and say, wow, God was preparing me that whole time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can definitely say, um, and even then I, I, I was prayerful because I, I remember not knowing what anxiety was and not knowing um, how anxiety can uh, impact the body and not having that language. But I look back on that now and I realize it was a really anxious time. It impacted my schoolwork, all of those things. But um, I remember uh, one of those mornings before I went to school and my mom could tell that I was visibly like, because. That was a lot to go through as a, as a young person. And, and she just stopped and prayed with me. Mm. So mm. having, you know, regular moments before school and praying with my mama at the dining room table um, was, was, was paramount. And then I can remember even in times when I was in fourth grade, um, I don't know why I did this, but in, in the fourth grade, I had just got a little precious moments Bible. It was a little precious yeah, moments yeah, yeah. Bible. Yeah. And I loved it because it had the pictures in it and it had, um, the, the more personable way of approaching some of the scripture. And in fourth grade, I was digesting it. And some of the scriptures that I was reading, you know, it, it, it resonated with me. And I was like, my peers need to know about some of these scriptures. So I would spend time copying scriptures onto notebook paper, cutting them out, and then passing them out and calling them the word of the day. Mm. So even as a fourth grader, I knew it was important in, in some way to spread the gospel. So it's, it's always been foundational. Pause. Do you have a favorite scripture? Um, I or one of the motivation. I think in seasons of life, other scriptures become more relevant for us. Yes. What, what scripture is relevant for you right now where you are in life? I, I think it's always been, um, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Okay, and, and it's, yeah. Yes, always. It's always been that. And, and it still is because in working at the NACP now and being and at a, at a time such as this, right, um, where so much is, it feels unknown, I have to remember that God truly does have a plan for what's supposed to happen um, with me, with you, with Alpha Street, with NAACP. So I, that, it sounds cliche, but I really have to think about how God has masterfully curated every part of my life and wow. I, I have to submit to it. All right. So you graduate from high school, 
You got to tell people where you landed because you know Alpha Street is a huge HBCU Ooh. congregation. So where did you wind up going after high school? I went to the Jackson State University. Why did I always put a the in front of the HBCU? The, the, and I want to say thank you so much for the contribution. Oh, of course, um, yeah. It, it made a difference and it has rippled throughout Jackson. And we have so many Alpha Street supporters in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and the fact that you chose that, that little bitty, well, the, the Everybody chose that little bitty, you know, university in, in a place like Jackson, Mississippi. We needed that and mm -hmm. we appreciate that and it has done a world of difference. So we really appreciate it. How are your years at Jackson State? The best years of my life. Okay. I, I still say that I, we didn't know what we had. Um, I probably should have used them differently. I probably should have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I keep trying to tell my, my <laughs> freshmen in college, boy, <laughs> these years are going to go by they are. really fast. And mm -hmm. they're going to be the best years of your life. And I, I was so busy. I wanted to run for student council. I wanted to run for Of Jackson course State. you did. All of those things. <laughs> but I wish I had taken a little bit more time and had fun. Um, you know, hung out on the plaza just a little bit more. Um, you know, done all, all of the stuff. We even had an international program that I did not take advantage of. Right. And I regret. So if the folks who are listening, if you're a young person in undergrad right now, if they have opportunities available, take them. To go, yeah. Yes. And uh, if I'm correct, um, you joined a certain Divine Nine organization while you were at Jackson. I did. <laughs> yes. Would you like to tell your soror so they know who they're dealing with? <laughs> yes, I'm a proud member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. When would you cross over? Um, spring 10. Spring 10. Yep. Oh, you make me feel old, girl. Okay, <laughs> we're going to move on from Jackson State. What happens after Jackson? Well, first of all, what was your major at Jackson State? So while I was at Jackson State, I um, started out as a mass communications major. Okay. Um, and mass comm was, was, it was doing its thing, but I wanted just a little bit more. Um, because of my background now, mm -hmm. the things that I had done it in high school and, you know, the type of involvement that I had, I wanted to make sure that I had some political science and policy under my belt as well. Okay. Um, because I, I didn't mention it earlier, my grandmother was an organizer in Meridian, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, and having that knowledge and knowing what she had done for the Head Start program and for civil rights in Mississippi, period, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to make sure that, you know, I carried that forward. Um, so I also ended up moving my minor to a major and uh, getting political science as well. So I got both of them. Okay. Yeah. So what happens to Amber after Jackson State? What's next? What's the big move? So I remember uh, walking on the plaza, not being sure about what internship I was going to get because I was trying to get up here to D.C. and nobody would have me. I, I was trying my best. I submitted so many applications. Um, and I was walking on the plaza. That's what we call the common area at Jackson State. And uh, one of my really, really good friends stopped and he said, hey, what you doing this summer? And I said, uh, I'm not sure. I said, but right now I'm going to McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he was like, um, you know, um, Obama got an office set up. And I said, Obama has an office? So he said, yeah, you, you should go by there. And I was like, I didn't know that Obama was doing anything in Mississippi. So I go by and I thought I was about to walk into an office that was packed and brimming with people. It was not. Mm. Um, and they needed uh, a digital, at that time it was called new media organizer. Okay. And that was social media, but it was new at the time. So I ended up doing that, and I learned so much about social media um, at that time. And, and Obama's administration, now that I look back on it, used social media in a way that a lot of people hadn't at the time. Right, right. Um, and I kind of parlayed that into other, you know, local opportunities to, to help other folks with their social media. Um, because you'd be surprised how many organizations at that time had no idea what right. to post, what to do. And I, it wasn't, you know, any schooling or anything available for it, but intuitively, coming from a, a comms background, I could do a few things. Yeah. One of the things I try to share with all career moves, especially with younger people, is that th there's this passage of scripture that basically says, cursed is the man or the woman that hates the day of small beginnings. Mm -hmm. That in a small environment, if you're not putting forth your best, you'll never know what doors that can mm -hmm. open. And so often we limit how much we're gonna give mm -hmm. based on what we think the potential will be not realizing that God is using that as a proving ground mm -hmm. to open up much larger other doors for you. So I would assume that you can look back and see the faithfulness in that little campaign office in Mississippi sir. was God's like springboard into other things for your life. Yes, sir. Absolutely. I think I was driving a, a 1990 Geo Prism mm -hmm. and that was in 20. That's where I drive now. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I remember eating a lot of Mac chickens, um, a, a lot of dollar menu items, 
uh, repurposing a lot of shoes to look different because I was doing a lot of work for no pay, but right. I believed in in what I was doing. I, I believed that, um, that that's a change that needed to come to Mississippi. Um, and while I was doing that, I also made a lot of connections. Um, and it was important just to continue to show up if it mm -hmm. was community events happening because I knew I wanted to continue to engage. I knew that I was a an, an advocate. It, it was in me. Um, and even though I, I came from very humble beginnings in, in, in Jackson, Mississippi, a uh, neighborhood called Subdivision 2 or West Haven Heights. And if you're, you're from Jackson, you know that's a lot of working class, regular mm -hmm. folks over there, you know, just mm -hmm. taking care of their families, doing what they need to do. So being from that area, um, my mom and dad still made sure that I had what I needed to get by to continue to do that work. And while I was there, I ended up meeting um, Remeeting uh, the Mississippi State Conference uh, president of NAACP, uh, Mr. Derek Johnson, and and that was um, a fantastic time because Mississippi was doing so much around voter registration, mm -hmm. and at that time, um, voter registration numbers needed to 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 go up, and we were in a place because of what was happening nationally for folks to be interested in you know, doing more voter registration. So once I got hired um, as a local organizer, actually on a, on a national level, because it was a contract with the national office, um, I, I remember riding around with uh, a small white table in my trunk, stacks of uh, this is my vote t-shirts in the back of my trunk, um, some literature and um, uh, voter registration forms. At any moment's notice, I was ready to set up a voter registration shop. I was outside of every rap concert that came to, to Jackson. Mm -hmm. We canvassed nightclubs. Uh, we went to the college parties. We did uh, any of the back to school lines. That's what we call grassroots. Gra grassroots, yes, sir. So um, outside of some of the WIC offices, you name it. We were there and I recruited other folks because folks needed, you know, um, um, community service hours, whether they wanted to graduate or pledge or whatever it was they wanted to do. So I ended up having a little small volunteer army and we would spend time, you know, communicating with the party promoters and, and uh, different churches to, to have time either on their announcements during church services or on a DJ booth um, in, in the mm -hmm. evening mm -hmm. uh, on college night. And we ended up doing very, very well for, for voter registration. And I remember um, my colleagues, you know, it was a golden time to be there and, and, and start doing that work. And because of how it made me feel, because I knew, um, as a matter of fact, I'll say this, I was in the grocery store maybe a year later and a guy walked up to me, I think it was a grocery store. And a guy walked up to me and, and he said, you know that night you got me registered to vote at that party? And in my mind, I, was like, I registered a lot of people to vote at the party. Did not remember him at all. I said, yeah. And he said, you know, that was my first time voting. And he said, I, I, I've been able to vote. And I, I said, well, I'm so glad that I, I was able to, to help. He said, and, you know, when I went and I, and I cast my ballot, I thought about you because you took your time to talk to me. And I said, well, I'm, I'm glad I, I could help. Mm. And, and looking back on that and knowing that if you take what seems to be complicated information, and package it so that folks can understand, um, people are gonna do what's in the best interest of the community because people are out here naturally doing what's in the best interest of their community. And I really believe that, um, you know, contrary to what a lot of media will tell you, we have some amazing folks already doing really good work in the community. So I think as we're watching and listening, we're seeing God directing your steps. Mm -hmm. Like we, we are seeing God shape this senior vice president of the NAACP long before she was getting paid to do so. Tell us the story of how the door opened for the position you're in now. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna just speed through just a, a few things. Um, while I was doing that, I enjoyed the NAACP and while we were doing that work, um, we knew we needed to continue to build up on what we'd been able to do in 2012 mm -hmm. um, and Mississippi had a, a coalition of unlikely people because it's some it's some racial divides that you see across the South, mm -hmm. um, but folks started to to work together and we wanted to make sure that we capitalized on that moment. Mm -hmm. um, what will people work together around? Um, and at at the NACP office and a nonprofit called One Voice um, and a coalition of folks uh, there in the community, after much conversation, education ended up being the issue that we knew no matter what household you're in, 
um, what income bracket, if you're, if you're not in an academy, and even some of the folks who had babies in the academy, care about the public education system. And in Mississippi, you know, it's not a constitutional right to have a fully funded public education. Right, right. Um, you, you get a public education, but having it uh, fully funded constitutionally is, is, is no teeth in it. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we changed that funding formula to be consistent every year and have it not be based on uh, your land or property taxes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because if you go to a, a little school in, in a neighborhood like mine, you know, working class folks, oftentimes you have old books, teachers are underpaid, um, things aren't paved, the school is not as safe, things like that. So we spent two years, the first year, collecting signatures, and we collected over 200,000 signatures to put an initiative on the ballot. Um, and the initiative was called Initiative 42. And our little organization was called Better Schools, Better Jobs. Um, and I've never seen a coalition of so many moms of different shades and complexions, so many dads of different shades, everybody, different income brackets, showing up to make sure that people um, got what they needed and to make sure that children across Mississippi, um, you know, could have the right to this fully funded public education. But as politics happens, um, once we got that initiative on the ballot, there was a little loophole in that law that said that the legislature could put in another initiative and they named their initiative the same as our initiative, except they said it was initiative 42A. And mm. they stole some of our language, but took out the money. So when people went to go and vote, it was confusing. So I spent a lot of time on doors um, that, that second year. Um, and we spent a lot of money on polling and trying to figure out how to educate people and what it, what was going to resonate with people. Mm. And um, I remember sitting in a campaign meeting and going, no, they have to choose it, then approve it, vote initiative 42. Because you had to uh, choose the initiative and then say that you wanted to change the Constitution. It was a two-step vote for regular people. And it's so, it's almost unheard of to mm -hmm. have to vote twice, a two-step vote on one issue. So imagine just a regular per person going into the polls, having two paragraphs of information and not understanding, like, what am I going to vote for? I don't want to mess this up. I'm actually not going to vote mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. We ended up uh, getting enough votes uh, where uh, people agreed with the initiative, but people didn't understand the language around changing the Constitution and they didn't want to change the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And we ended up losing. Okay. And after losing something that I spent two and a half years on, um, I, I had been hospitalized um, because I ended up getting really sick out of exhaustion. Um, I, I was still um, taking care of my parents and doing what I needed to do. But after spending two and a half years doing that type of work at festivals, um, at courthouses, going to circuit clerk's offices all across the state every day, we, we bypassed um, 4th of July, because that's when people were outside. So we were, you know, we, we were educating them then. Um, we were there around Christmas events. We were educating them. There was literally no time off because I really believed in my heart and in my soul that if we can make sure that children on the K through 12 level got the education that they needed, we could educate an electorate to change the world. Um, and, and that was the purpose. So when, when, we, when we lost it, Nobody had prepared me for a loss. Mm. I didn't know what to do with failure at that time, but I knew that I needed um, a fresh perspective and I knew I needed to go um, somewhere else where they were doing something different. And I needed a, a, a master's. So I was like, I I'm gonna apply to uh, a couple programs. And I was looking online and I saw Bell Hooks giving a, a talk. And I think she was talking about her All About Love um, book and I wanted to be wherever Bill Hooks was because okay. she, she was awesome, you know. And um, I ended up going to the new school where I got uh, my master's in urban policy analysis and management. Um, and while there, I worked for the uh, Children's Services Administration. I worked um, for, for three different, three or four different ones, but the, the one that I, I really, really enjoyed, because I, I did some stuff around bail reform that they actually used. Um, and then I, I ended up doing some research around um, uh, race-based discrimination in homogenous communities. So what it looks like in, in white communities um, and, and how black people feel in those areas and just doing some, some scholarly research around that. And I presented it to the New York City Commission on Human Rights. And uh, I remember the commissioner 
you know, being brought to tears. And I had no idea why this lady was crying during my presentation. And she was like, I just really believe what you're saying. She said, it's been a long time since I've had somebody come in and believe so deeply in what they're presenting. And she was like, do you want a job? And I was like, Commissioner Malalas, I would love a job. <laughs> I would love a job. Um, so after a while, I did end up working there. And one of my favorite projects that we worked on um, was uh, the legal guidance on black hair. And I didn't know that you could have legal guidance on black hair because I'm, you know, mm -hmm. uh, just a girl from Mississippi. You know, you, you straighten your hair for Easter speeches and you do your thing and, you know, whatever. You don't wear braids the first day. It's just all of these little rules that you, that you learn over time. And I learned that was wrong. Um, and helping to write that legal guidance and then seeing state after state use language that I helped to create. Mm -hmm blew my mind yeah. because initially that language said, uh, it said something about the hairstyles. You can't discriminate against braids. You can't discriminate against afros. And I had to stop them. I said, hey, it's not about the hairstyle. It's about black hair. I said, stop. The legislation, the legal guidance should sh say no discrimination based on black hair, whether relaxed, whether afro, Whatever you got Jerry going on, Carroll. Jerry, whatever you you know, <laughs> let your soul glow, Pastor. It's fine, do it. Um, but I ended up seeing, you know, that legislation and that that guidance, the language I helped create, you know, go across the country, and that blew my hair back. I was wow. like, you know, no pun intended, but it, it really did. Mm. Um, and New York got really expensive, so I decided uh, to transition out of New York, and I, I wanted to to get back to my NAACP roots. And I started at the NACP a little bit before the pandemic started. Okay. Um, moved here, and I started out as the the operations director, and um, I didn't know that my job was going to be so tied to to what happens to um, a group of working people during a pandemic, and how do you keep them going? Um, so I, I ended up doing that um, and went from operations director to VP. And then they said I was doing a really great job and I kept coming to work. <laughs> so I got a uh, senior vice president of operations at the NAACP and it has been the job of my dreams. So two quick questions, Amber. What, um, in your position and with the work with NAACP, what two or three social justice issues are really critical for you right now? I know the NAACP fights on many fronts, many battles for people of color from you know, A to Z. Mm -hmm. What three are passionate in your heart? So I will say that, Pastor, my role, and that's why I was so surprised when y'all asked me to, to come and sit down. I, you know, I was crying, shaking, throwing up. I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be amazing. Um, but my role is so internal. Mm. Um, I, I always, when I'm explaining what I do to people, folks usually think about the NACP and they say, oh, y'all are advocating, marching for stuff. If you think about the operations role, we help get the approvals to even march. I got you, okay. Um, if, if they're walking over the bridge, we help build it um, in my role. Mm. Um, operations, we pay attention to all of the little details to make sure things can even happen. Mm. Um, you see the Image Awards, there's some operations folks behind the Image Awards. Um, you see some of the, the things that are happening on a unit or a branch level. Um, you know, operations is, is there for that as well. But the, the thing that, we're focusing on, I would say, most right now is preparing for 2024. I've heard you say from the pulpit several times that you know what's coming. You know, yeah. you, you've been a, a, a bellwether. You know what's coming. So our job right now is to have an army of volunteers, not the army that I had outside of the Boosted concerts in, in right, Jackson, right, right. but a, a, a serious um, intergenerational army. And folks will be surprised because um, I'm a young person at the NACP, young, 35. Um, but our, our workplace right now is very intergenerational. It's skewing actually a little bit younger. Mm -hmm. And our membership, um, and if you do want to join the NACP, I know you're a member, but if anybody else wants to join the NACP, go to NACP.org and you can sign up for a membership immediately you get something in email, you get a digital card, you're ready to roll, we'll connect you to your, your local units. But I would say our, the thing that we're focusing on most right now um, is uh, making sure that we have volunteers for civic engagement in 2024. 
Um, we're focusing on making sure that people understand what's happening with Medicaid mm. um, because so many of our friends and family and our aunts and uncles um, had some changes happen to their Medicaid over you know, the last six months. And we need to make sure that when it's time for mama and daddy to go to the doctor, they have what they need to be seen mm -hmm. um, because that's a game changer that, that changes lives. Yeah. And then also um, uh, some of the work around the, the student debt relief has been really, really important. Mm -hmm. Those are just three things that right. we're focusing on at the association. There, there's some stuff around education, of course, that's happening, stuff around economy that's happening. Um, it's a really, really golden time to be at the association. Yeah. Ever as we wrap up, I want to, first of all, I want to thank you. As I hear your story and as one looking from the outside in, I see the hand of God all throughout it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I hear you talk about having a praying mother. Um, what role has faith really played for you in where you've gotten, and even more so, the role of Alpha Street Baptist Church? We're proud to have a member like you. We're proud that the woman who runs operations at NWCP sits in the Alpha Street Baptist Church absorbing her faith and being fed and filled. So what role does faith play for you, and what role does the church play? And I have a good team of operators. We're all smooth operators at the NACP. But all I would right, say, <laughs> <laughs> but I would say, um, faith has been paramount. It's no way that I could walk into buildings, um, you know, where the NACP lives, knowing that I have staff members there, knowing that I have people um, who are showing up all over the country and convening in order to to change the material condition of their lives. Um, I can't do that with man alone. I can't do that, you know, operating in flesh. I have to be connected to, to the one that I serve. Um, Jesus Christ has saved me. Um, and the, the, it's something about when you accept Christ, something happens where, and, and I don't know if everybody gets it, but I hope they do, that level of discernment where you're operating and you know what's right. Mm. Um, and, and I thank God for the gift of discernment. Um, and it, it's, it's made the difference in my life. All right, great. Final question, career advice. So we brought you on because with God's grace, faith, hard work, presence, showing up, you progressed to a very high place at a very young age. You're now speaking to some young, some young lady coming out of Jackson, Mississippi, who's looking at you. What piece of advice do you give them about following their call, what they're created to do, rising to the top of their profession. What, what, what career advice do you give us? I would first say, um, be prayerful in the decisions that you make. Mm -hmm. Don't do anything uh, that doesn't feel right. And, and you'll know what feels right to you, um, especially if you're prayerful and, and you've accepted Christ as your savior. Um, I would say don't always go into situations for compensation or mm, mm. Um, accolades and acknowledgement. Follow the thing that you're going to do anyway. Um, and and I, I was thinking about it um, not too long ago. I would be, if I wasn't Senior Vice President of Operations at the NAACP, I would still be on the unit level mm. doing what I need to do. Right. Do the thing that you know you're going to do anyway. Yeah. Um, and you're going to find it a lot easier to navigate life when you've chosen things based on based on passion, mm -hmm. things that you can do. Um, and no matter what, continue to show up. I used to have this thing where, where uh, now I think I've changed just a little bit. But in, in, when I was a little bit younger, I would say nobody can outwork me. Mm -hmm. I'm showing up early. I'm leaving late. If I believe in it, I'm there. Nobody can outwork me. Yeah. Show your work ethic. Show your work ethic. And, and black women, uh, young black women, black men, we, we don't have a problem showing our work ethic. Right. Um, so if, if those three things, uh, I think I've, I've stayed uh, true to, and it's, it's helped me get this far. Amber, thank you. You're exactly what we would hope we would expose the world to, are the people that God is shaping in our pews who are also going out shaping the world that Alpha Treat is much more than just a place of worship and praise, but it's a place where we discern purpose, where we learn the power of prayer, where we're grounded in the word, where we build community. 
And to kind of summarize what you said, chase purpose, the bag will follow. Mm -hmm. You know, but if you chase the purpose for which God has called you, the money seems to follow. Mm -hmm. Ever, we pray you well. 2024 is coming. We need you. Yes. Pray your health, your strength, your yes. well-being, and uh, getting us out there to vote. Yes. Do what we got to do because we got to fight the evil that's on the way. Yes, sir. Y'all, this is Pastor Wesley. I am so grateful to be able to help you meet the street and look forward to our next episode where we'll share with you some more phenomenal people who attend the Alpha Street Baptist Church. <laughs>